Today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 121. It's found on the overhead screen and on page 612 of the Pew Bible. Our Lord and our God, now as we hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God. <coughs> I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. <clears throat> he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches, he watches over Israel with neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going now and forevermore. This is the word. Our New Testament reading comes from John's Gospel, found in the 11th chapter, verses 25 through 37. Listen again for the word of the Lord. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who, who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met them. When the Jews who had been with Mary and who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. <coughs> when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, <coughs> and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he, this Jesus, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the scripture passage, Lazarus had died. Jesus had heard that he had been sick. Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha, a family with whom Jesus had deep connection and loved very much. Believing that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, perhaps my sisters told he, Lord, if you would have been there, my brother wouldn't have died. Lazarus had died. Today we continue our sermon series on God's covenant love, where we are interviewing a series of individuals from our congregation who can speak to and attest God's covenant love in real life situations. Today we are blessed to have the Reverend Alex Chamberlain with us today. Alex, come on up. Alex is a, a fine colleague to me and the Boise Presbytery. And Alex is not a, a pastor of the Covenant Church. He worships here. He and his wife, Dana, are integral parts 
uh, of the membership here at Covenant, but for his day job when he's not playing drums in our band. <laughs> Alex is uh, a chaplain and medical ethicist for St. Luke's, not just St. Luke's downtown, but for the whole health system. Is that right? Kind of? It's getting there. Fair enough. But Alex is the person, if Lazarus was at St. Luke's, who is going in with Mary and Martha at the death of their brother and saying, Lord, if you had been here, this critical turning point in our life would not have happened. And this is the man who gets to be with Mary and Martha and speak to God's covenant love in Jesus. So I introduce to you, if we could give the Reverend Alex Schumann a round of applause and welcome to the Alex, I didn't get your introduction quite right. So could you tell us all exactly what it is that you do as a host? And a little bit about yourself here, too. I'm a halftime chaplain and halftime coordinator of clinical ethics for the Treasure Valley, which would be Boise and Meridian and Nampa and the other health facilities related to St. Luke's. And an ethics consultant comes alongside people who are staring at the ceiling at night, a nurse or a doctor who's not sure what the right thing is to do. Or there's a conflict between family members and physicians about the treatment plan. And is this person likely to survive? And the family is saying, even a 1% chance is worth going for. The doctor is saying, that means there's a 99% chance we're going to harm them. And so what do we do now when they call me? And they call you. Have any of you been to the emergency room with a loved one where you weren't planning to go there, but there you are faced with a situation, a critical turning point. Perhaps it is the death of a loved one. Perhaps it is a diagnosis that you weren't expecting, but all of a sudden, whether you've been preparing for it or not, you are faced with a critical life turning point. And my pastoral guess is that every one of you would raise your hand. So Alex, when I introduced you, you, you pointed out a badge to us. Tell us about this badge and what it enables you to do. Um, and, and maybe you've already said it, but I'm curious about this badge. So it says Alex C. So they don't give you a full name on these, so people can't look you up on Facebook and stuff. Um, <laughs> what are you posting on Facebook? Oh my God. <laughs> so it says chaplain underneath, and if you turn it over, it says coordinator of medical staff services. So whichever role I'm in, chaplain or ethicist, <coughs> I flip the badge and change my focus. And at the very bottom, it says OTDR, and that's another role. I'm an organ and tissue donation requested. So I go to families when they've had to say goodbye to their loved one and let them know that there's an opportunity to help others if they're willing to consider it. So we make them aware that there's a legal requirement for us to look into whether a person could give a gift of organs or tissue and then we explain to the family what that would look like and we tell them that whatever they choose works for us. Okay. So when we gathered to talk about what this chat would look like, um, we're gonna talk about God's covenant of love during those critical turning points. But you pretty immediately brought up a situation where you wanted to describe your task, where you're walking into that room where a family is faced with a critical turning point. Um, you brought up one of my favorite authors, Henry Nowen. Uh, tell us about your experience with Nowen and how that influences you when you walk into that room with Martha and Mary, who are struggling with the loss of Lazarus. So I had the privilege of going to a seminary outside Trenton, New Jersey. The name again is Pittsburgh? No, Princeton. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> the other QTS. <laughs> the rivalry. Some of you remember Phil Moran and I having a rivalry about that, but he went to San Francisco, which is like, nah, that's <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, Henry Nowen spoke at my graduation from seminary, and he used the text of when 
Peter and Jesus are conversing after the resurrection, and uh, Dr. Nowen said to us that a question was asked, a task was given, and a promise was made. And the question that was asked of Peter by Jesus was, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. The task that was given was feed my sheep. Help me find good graves, uh, asks the person who comes to a pastor. And um, now he said that unless you can say, yes, I love you, um, being a pastor is not only useless, it's quite dangerous because people give you a great deal of influence over their lives. So uh, he made it clear that we should all be able to say, yes, I love you to Jesus. And the task of feeding the sheep he said in the Presbyterian Church means meetings. He <laughs> uh, was a good Catholic. He said, he, said, he said the world loves meetings. The world drowns in meetings, and we need to not have meetings deflect us. And the last part especially rings true for me now when uh, Jesus made a prediction to Peter. He said, now you gird yourself and go where you want but the day will come where you will be taken where you rather would not go. And when I get called on my pager, um, and to have a sense of call has two meanings for me when I'm on call. Um, I might get called in the emergency room with a child that had a near drowning, and my stomach still does flip-flops because I'd rather not go, but since I have a sense of call, to be with people in those situations, and I feel I'm given the gift to do that without flinching, um, I go. And it fills me with a sense of confirmation of that sense of call to what I do. You've been a hospital chaplain for 20 years now? 29? 29. You're only like 42 years old. <laughs> Yeah, I was a toddler when I was <laughs> going back to call. Uh, I hesitate to ask this question because when I think about your vocation, you're always dealing with families who would rather not be where they are, uh, as now one's pointed to out in the scripture. Um, but there you are. So I hesitate to ask this question. Uh, tell us about some good times, because to me that doesn't necessarily sound good. What are some good times in your ministry with people who are facing critical turning points? I was once called a labor and delivery. Normally when a chaplain's called a labor and delivery, golf. Someone's having to say goodbye. In this case, a woman uh, came to the hospital. She moved to Boise about three months earlier, and um, she had a divorce in her previous living occupation, living situation, came to Boise, and after her divorce, she went through a promiscuous phase and became pregnant and didn't know who the father was. But she said, I'm going to deliver this baby and have it out for adoption. She moved to Boise, got work, and uh, she didn't have any prenatal care. She didn't want to kind of acknowledge how this baby had been conceived. And then she came in in labor, and she had no labor coach, nobody at her side, and the nurse said, um, let me call someone who can introduce themselves to you, and maybe they can be alongside you. So I met this woman, and I said that I had been there for the delivery of my three children. I cut the cord and, and helped my kids into the world. I didn't faint into the sterile field, and I'd be glad to accompany her if she'd be willing. And she burst into tears and took my hand. So I got dressed in scrubs and I became the labor coach for this woman who gave birth to a wonderful baby boy and I cut the cord. And then the next day, said a prayer of blessing with them as she handed this child to a young couple. So what a privilege. What a privilege, yeah. And so your work isn't always gloom and doom. They don't usually call us when things are going great. <laughs> but there are moments when there's celebration, a sigh of relief, and we give thanks. Mm. Tell us about a challenging time 
in your work as a hospital chaplain or a chaplain in general. Um, I just want to do a little theological detour before I do, and that is um, when you feel you have a sense of call, if you say yes, then I believe God forms a covenant with you. And uh, that can be anybody <coughs> among all of you, too. You get a call of going to the rescue mission or a sense of I'm drawn to doing this or drawn to doing that. And when you have that sense of call, uh, like Moses and Elijah and the prophets, people are tentative and they go, I don't know the words. I don't know how to be in this situation on your behalf, Lord. And God basically says, if you've answered the call, I'll help you get through that. Um, and so I was in seminary and you do field education. You work at a church. Um, you have some kind of work where you're reflecting on that work and kind of putting your toe in the water as a minister. You're not yet ordained and you're trying on that coat to see if it fits. And you see if people are also acknowledging you in that role to see if that call is being confirmed by the wider community. And I had a program where I was a police chaplain for a year part time in a neighboring community outside Princeton. And a drunk driver hit a woman coming home from the grocery store and T boned her, and the car burst into flames and she was killed. And the police called me and said, uh, we just had a, a drunk driver kill a mother of four boys. We mentioned to the husband uh, that as the boys came home from school, um, we'd offer some support through a chaplain if he'd like one. And so I went to that home. And I was still really green. And as each boy come, came home from school, the father uh, told them that their mother had been killed. Each of the four boys had a different reaction. One was pacing. One wanted to talk, one was curled up in a fetal position, not wanting to be acknowledged. And uh, I got a sense that it would be good for me to ask them, any of you want to take a walk? And two of them immediately said yes. And as we walked around the block about four times, one of them turned to me, the youngest who'd been in that feeble position, and he said, what do we do now? I said, we keep putting one foot in front of the other like we're doing right now. And um, live, even though your world's been turned upside down. Went back to the house, joined hands in a circle, offered a prayer, uh, gave the dad my phone number, and I went out to the curb um, after calling the police to come pick me up. I called them like this. I didn't have a cell phone back in 1980. Um, and I went out to the curb and sat down and sobbed. But I also felt a sense of, um, this fits for me. So when people hear what I do, they say, oh, I could never do that. Well, if you had the call and you have gifts and you feel that you and God have an understanding and a covenant, then it's not a burdensome work. It's a joy to work out of that sense of what rings true. Mm. Alex, you, I love this badge. In some ways, I'm jealous of it, and then I hear of your work, and then I'm not jealous of your badge. No one gave me a badge here. Oh, thanks. No, no, <laughs> thank you. That goes off at 2.30 in the morning. Um, you talked about your own professional vocation. But all of us have been called to be children of God. So what happens when you are not chaplain and in your own family you experience a critical turning point? Uh, what happens when that badge is not open but your dad or son or brother? Can you tell us about that? Does that question make sense? Yeah. Talk a little bit about my dad. Yeah. Um, he got a call. Uh, which button? The main one? Uh, this one, that one. Okay. Um, he, like many men of his generation, got a call. They were called up at the beginning of World War II. And when you are got a call to join the military, I believe there's a covenant with you 
and the, the government says, we're gonna train you, give you the tools you need, um, you'll be a part of a group, you'll get benefits, and since you're putting your life on the line, um, the government is going to have an agreement with you about your future care, you get wounded, you'll be taken care of, and so on. Um, so my father responded to that sense of call and had an agreement with the government. And as he came home, he entered the business world, but his job wasn't really his vocation. His call was to help people at turning points in their lives. And he developed a program with other men uh, with a group at the Monroe County Developmental Center in Rochester, New York. They set up a workshop and they had skills in plastics, electrical, metal, my father in wood. He kind of ran, he called his group of elves. And they would build developmentally challenged people, people who had strokes, adaptive aids. And they would um, create stuff or remodel homes. And it was all volunteer. They had materials donated. And uh, I visited him once in his, our home workshop. And I said, how do you come up with this stuff? And he looked toward the ceiling and he said, I get help. And he was an elder in the Presbyterian church. Uh, my mother was a deacon. So um, his sense of call was not to ordain ministry. His call was not the same as his paid work. It was something he did where he felt that he had gifts and responsibilities that came with that. When he developed esophageal cancer, had surgery, subsequently he was on hospice, he called me by phone. We were in New Zealand at that point, and uh, he said, it's now gone to my liver, and I'm not gonna seek further treatment apart from just going home. And I burst into tears, and I thanked him for telling me, and he said, well, in our family, we share the good and we share the bad. So he kind of led the household and um, being a traditional man, a World War II vet, he was the king of the castle. And the deal with the kids is, I'll put food on the table, you'll have a roof over your head, help you get to college. Um, but he brooked no dissent. When he told me it was time to rake the leaves, it wasn't a suggestion. <laughs> uh, there was a chain of command, but within that, there was also an agreement, I'll take care of you. And when he, uh, we learned he was dying, he asked me if I wanted to officiate at the funeral. And I said, nope. <laughs> I'm gonna sit in the front pew and blubber with my brother and sister. But I'll read one scripture passage. And he chose Psalm 121. And that, that's kind of a, a ringing theme for my ministry is, God will keep your going out and your coming in. And whether you're going out of this life or coming into this life, I'm the one who comes alongside to represent in a very humble way, not a grandiose way, uh, that God is accompanying them as well. And I didn't do my mother's funeral. I read that passage at hers as well. I didn't marry my kids. I walked my daughter up the aisle. I stood with my son as best man. Didn't baptize my kids. I'm not the minister, I'm the dad. So I've got a pretty clear boundary about those roles that's usually intact. Okay, so you're talking about this concept of maybe a professional vocation, what, what you get paid to do, and also your vocation as a family member, uh, this call that God has given you. Reverend, these people out here, do you think that they've been called by God? Well, we believe in a term called the priesthood <coughs> of all believers. So yeah, each of you has had something happen to you that you can't explain away. A dream, a thought, um, that circle for me once happened at a hospital in New Zealand where I'd done some teaching and I was walking down the stairs and as I, my foot went the first step, a thought came to me, go to ICU. Wasn't audible, but I just had a thought, go to ICU. And I thought to myself, I was in ICU two hours ago. Everything's okay there. 
I took a second step and the thought came, I said, and if you get the thought saying, I said, pay attention. And I went to ICU, this hospital in New Zealand, and there was an American on a ventilator about to die. We'd been on vacation. We had a big turn. So listen to those nudges. Another thing about my father's covenant with us, he gave me good childhood experiences. That's a five pound, three ounce large mouth that I caught. Uh, he got us up at old dark 30, hired a guide, and took us sun fishing. And that's just the stuff of what family covenants look like. And your covenants with God and your sense of call may look simple, mundane, going fishing, doing something that fits for you um, and feels good, even if it's challenging. All of these people have been called by God in some way. Show us a terrific image of your own child. So that's a good fish, Alex. Well done. Good fish. You have one more photo, I know. Two more. Show us the next few. Yeah, that's my mother. Um, that was probably my sister's wedding. Even though my father was the king of the castle, she worked behind the scenes. Not exactly to sabotage him. <laughs> but when he said, this is the way it is, she'd nod. And then a week later, that was the way it was. <laughs> and so I think they had their own agreement or covenant about how their marriage worked to give us a home. Um, and she was a traditional stay at home. You walk in the door from school, you get your favorite snack. Um, just another kind of anchor for the household. So I was very blessed that um, even when there were tensions, like any home, there were always that sense of, it's a safe refuge. And then my last picture relates to my first call to parish ministry in Wyoming. <laughs> That's what a church house. Well, they're just doing a cattle drive through town, you know. It's like five mile road. <laughs> the usual. Um, and I had a friend who had a church in rural Minnesota who came to visit me. And he said, I thought I had a country church. <laughs> Where I live is urban sprawl compared to Wyoming. <laughs> but there again, it was a sense of me in many ways fumbling through things. I knew I had a call to ministry, and it became clear to me that parish ministry, even though it was an extrovert, I enjoyed preaching, and I enjoyed the pastoral care. I was not a great administrator. I was not a great leader of groups. So hospital chaplaincy, much more fits in like a glove. So if any of you have a call, and as you're living out of that, you sense like, this doesn't really fit. It is a good thing to change horses or cattle and, and do something different. It doesn't mean that that other call was invalid, but you're trying to work through the whispers that you hear from the Lord, trying to sort them in your own life and Pay attention to the whispers, but also be willing to be nudged uh, from different direction if something else is emerging. And that's how I felt very comfortable moving to chapter. Alex, you're a good pastor. I was going into this interview thinking we're going to have Alex talk about life in the ER, facing death. And he responds very pastorally by pointing to those covenant relationships in our own life that's not necessarily clinical, like at the hospital, but we saw pictures of mom, dad, and church. These essential covenants that we all have and live into. So as all these folks who have been called by God in similar circumstances with family and church and community and all those unique yet similar covenant relationships, when they encounter those critical turning points in life by going down to the hospital. What faithful advice would you give to these folks when the phone rings, the cell phone, because we're not in 1980 anymore, cell phone rings and says something bad has happened. What advice? In your family or 
It may be a friend and you're going to support them, or you're going to lead the support. Either one, either one. Um, show up. Your words may feel not at all eloquent. You may feel like you're churning inside. Show up. You don't need perfect words. You've got a perfect Lord who's as close as your next breath. Don't run from that situation. Trust that a sigh of relief will come. Um, but don't leave physically or emotionally or mentally. Accompany these people. Be alongside them. And then make sure you eat and drink and take care of yourself. Show up. And I would, pastors like to have the last line, right? I think about that scripture, for, who's the pastor here? Yeah. <laughs> <I think. laughs> Martha and Mary were there with their brother who had died. And in some ways they were angry. They didn't want to be there. And they said, Jesus, if you were, had been here, this would not have happened. And even in their anger, Jesus showed up. And Jesus is always faithful, even in the face of death, uh, even when we're angry and maybe even don't want Jesus to be there. Jesus still shows up. Let's pray for you. Lord, we give you thanks for our brother Alex and all the good that he does, not only at St. Luke's, but in this church community and in his family. Lord, thank you in this pastoral sense that as we talk about covenants, that we don't point to fancy theology. We just talk about mom and dad and church and God's faithfulness. Because maybe that's what it's all about. Is that our sense of professional call and personal call is all about you and us showing up. So Lord, give us the courage and the faith and the capacity that as we encounter those critical turning points that we show up Jesus to show up too. <coughs> Amen. God is